What's the point of all this technology without a little love in our lives? Our hosts, Tatiana Moroz, Dr. Stephanie Murphy, and Lauren Kasovitz have come together to bring you Proof of Love. Go to proofoflovecast.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very exciting episode of Proof of Love. We're getting up to our one-year anniversary, which is exciting. We came out on Valentine's Day 2019. We'll be doing a little bit of promo around that for the one-year anniversary show on February 14th, 2020. Uh, But I'm joined with quite a few guests today. Not only do I have my two beautiful co-hostesses, but I have an awesome crypto couple that we're going to be talking to. But first, let's say hello to our co-hostesses. Hello, Lauren Kasovitz. How are you today? Hello, I'm doing great. I've missed you guys. I'm really excited I could make this taping. Me too. And of course, we have Dr. Stephanie Murphy making an appearance. Hey, Steph. Hi there. It's so awesome to be here with everybody. Yes, I'm very happy to be here with you all, as I always am. Proof of Love has been a really great experience. People, they ask me, you know, what's one of my favorite things about the crypto space? And I'm like, actually making this show. So we've got some new things coming out for 2020. We'll be sharing them with you. But for this episode, we're actually going to be talking to Day and Ari Yu, who are some crypto friends of mine. They've been married for eight years. They have a tech background and they're going to tell us how do they do it all. Uh, they have some kind of interesting background stories that we're going to talk about. And I don't know, you know, we're trying to show proof of love and they've got some love to prove. Uh, I think they've already proved it. So I'm very happy to have them joining us. Uh, Ari's actually been on the Tatiana show with me a couple times before. I've also been on their podcast. They can tell you about that too. So welcome to the show, guys. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having yeah, us, everyone. Thanks for having us. Awesome. So Ari and Day, can you guys give me a little bit of background about each of your professional careers and also about your podcast that you've been doing? Yeah, Ari will go first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, me, a uh, serial entrepreneur, been uh, working in startups since uh, the late 90s and uh, came out to Seattle around 2001. Did my management consulting career, worked in all sorts of tech companies up and down the West Coast, and I saw a lot of opportunities that aren't actually around technology. Like, you think you've been in technology for so long, but it's just the same old human crap that like <laughs> makes it really hard for tech companies and makes them want to hire consultants, right? It's like, oh, this group's not talking to that group. And, you know, this group wants to get promoted or this group wants the funding or this group is worried they're going to get cut with funding or, you know, a whole bunch of, it's all human stuff that like makes it hard, unnecessarily hard for us. And so I realized, oh, like, you know, learning about humans and relationships is really important. And so, you know, I was also single at that time. And so, you know, it became a really big passion of mine. And then even today, like even in the world of blockchain, you know, I started the uh, Cascadia Blockchain Council, which is made up of uh, member companies. We have over 100 blockchain related companies here in the uh, Pacific Northwest. And again, it's just, you know, people, we just get really busy working on our own projects and our own organizations, our own things. And we got to remember to like, put our heads up and look around and break down these silos and remember to talk to each other. So that's me in a nutshell. Awesome. Yeah. I want to talk about some of the the books that you've been reading around personal development, because before you got married, you had some, some books that you liked and a couple that you recommended to me, but day, we want to hear from you. Tell us a little bit about your life before you met this beautiful woman that changed everything. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> My background's a little, I don't know, slightly odd in that you know so I'm Korean American just like areas but I grew up in North Carolina I grew up in a small town out there and then moved out here to Seattle in the mid 90s to start my career and I basically spent a couple of decades working in the business of wide area networks and internet infrastructure and basically that is a you know a um I don't know, a long way of saying that I worked on the internet, the stuff that makes everything work, but people don't know about it. And so it's really, really analogous to what's going on these days with respect to, um, you know, the infrastructure of Bitcoin and, you know, the protocol, you know, the software rules that make up Bitcoin and all the other related, you know, cryptocurrencies, digital assets and, and everything. 
And so, um, you know, so I have a technical background in electrical engineering. I decided to, you know, kind of shift my focus out of telecom and wider networks and internet uh, into Bitcoin and blockchains. And so, uh, yeah, dove uh, full, full in, you know, like uh, mid 2018. And uh, now here we are like a year and a half later or so. I'm still marveling on how both of you said that you've been working in tech since the 90s. Like you do not look old enough to be working in tech since the 90s. Agreed. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's the, uh, the Asian genes. <laughs> Asian people were really good until we we're like 60, 70. And then we turned like prunes all at once. <laughs> do you do anything for beauty secrets? Yeah, I want to know about that. I heard there's a lot of good Asian beauty secrets that they're keeping to themselves. I would like to know. So this is kind of a joke. So from when me and Ari were dating, I, w- I, w- I told Ari that <laughs> I was very sebaceous. And so it's like, it's like basically you want to keep your skin like moisturized and, you know, clean and all this kind of stuff. But I told her I was sebaceous and she was like, I am too. And then I was like, you don't know what that means, do you? <laughs> I'm sebaceous. I thought it meant special. <laughs> But basically, you know, I just, you know, I just have naturally very oily skin. You know, I, I think that lends to the semi-youthful look, even into uh, pushing 50 here. So, you know, um, <laughs> it is looking, what it is. He's looking sexier with his salt and pepper. Like, he's getting more <laughs> and more salt. And I'm like, ooh, yeah. Uh, for me, I'm like, so Day and I are actually opposite. Like, he's the guy that'll wash his hands twice every time he washes his hands. I'm the person that you really have to mind to use soap. <laughs> <laughs> And so I'm like the worst to talk about routines on this stuff, like face cleanliness and. <laughs> <laughs> so no beauty secrets. No, I use water. You just woke up like this. Great. <laughs> That's, <good. laughs> That's about it. So, well, good for you guys. Um, I'm curious, like, how did you meet each other? <laughs> we have two stories. Yeah, it's very painful for me. Painful. Yeah, it's painful for me. Uh, so, so I ran into Ari at a mixer at a happy hour and she was extremely memorable because she showed up on a scooter and on crutches. And so I, you know, I remember, you know, trying to strike up a conversation with her and didn't really get anywhere. And, and that was it. And then years later, of course, I knew who she was and I told her that we had met and she said, no, we didn't. (laughs) And that was the first time I remember meeting him like four years later. That was, yeah, four years years later. later. And I went to this uh, Yelp event. We were both Yelp elite at that time. We love going to bars and restaurants and stuff like that. They used to have these like elite events for those that are really active in the Yelp community. And so I go to this event and, you know, I'm, I think I was like, I had just turned 30 or very early 30s. And uh, I'm like, oh, who's the old guy here? <laughs> and uh, I had known of him. Like he was president of the Korean community in the Pacific Northwest and part of the old guard. <laughs> <laughs> But he was like, he hung out with the old people and, you know, he it was like made in Korea. I was made in the USA. And so <laughs> we started talking. I was like, oh, he, he doesn't, doesn't have a Korean accent. He, he actually speaks English really well. And then we started talking a little more. And I'm like, oh, he's actually pretty cool. And then one of our first conversations was around Dr. Gottman and his, um, what was it, like seven principles for a highly, like, for a successful marriage, I yeah. think, maybe some of that. Yeah. yeah, and then... John Gottman, the, the four horsemen of the relationship apocalypse, the guy who has the love lab. Yes. Yeah. So we had both started becoming really obsessed with this, and so we started talking about what the crappy relationship, and we were both coming out of crappy relationships, and so we were both kind of talking about it and thinking on it, and so that's how we... I used to make her... So John Gottman did a <laughs> um, speaker's forum here in Seattle. I think it runs like maybe 45 minutes or so. But I had that um, appearance that he did on an MP3. And so for the first couple <laughs> of years we were married, I would force her to listen to it in the car uh, so that we could make sure we're staying okay with our you know, relationship and stuff. Uh, we haven't listened to it in a while. And, and so we should actually revive that uh, tradition, old tradition. Life for children. That's yeah. why. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question for you. Oh, go ahead, Steph. No, no, you. Well, I was just curious if either one of you or both of you primarily dated outside of the Asian community or, or within before each other. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. I, yeah? I avoided all Korean men like the plague. Really? So, Why? Yeah. Well, I grew up with a pretty rocky uh, family life growing up. My mom had dated Korean guys and 
even my own birth father, I just didn't really have a high opinion of Korean men. I saw the culture as very like macho and putting women down and, you know, having to be subservient to men. And I really didn't want to sign up for that kind of life. And so I dated everybody else. <laughs> like everybody else. <laughs> oh, <come on. laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. And then when they wanted to start dating, I told them no many, many times of the very strongly. Uh, but when we started dating, I think I finally started dating him because he was probably the, he is, he is the most high integrity, trustworthy guy that you I've ever met. Like, you know, like if you're going to spend the rest of your life with someone, I was like, I should be with someone that I really, really, really know will never, ever, ever, ever. Probably never. <laughs> <laughs> probably never. I don't know. He's just like the most trust, trustful, trusting and trustworthy guy that I've met. And is that something that you kind of picked up, picked up on kind of intuitively? Or was that as you guys started dating? Well, I mean, he's, he's a very eccentric guy. <laughs> <laughs> Eccentric's good. <laughs> and he would do lots. He's very, very quirky. And he would always follow through. Like, I'll call you later. I was like, <laughs> he's going to send me a lame text. And he would call me instead of a lame text. And I was like, wow, that's really great. And uh, not lazy. So, you know, and when we had not started dating, so there was a good like three, four months where we were, I was very adamant we were not dating and we we're just friends. But I don't know, maybe in his brain, he was like, maybe there's hope. So he would call me at like 10, three and I'd be like, hey, um, I'm not driving through the neighborhood yet, but I'm planning to be. So I'm going to drive by your place. Could you come out and just give me a hug and then run back in? I won't, I don't need anything else. I just need a hug. I'm like, what? <laughs> oh, I love that. Or you drop by and be like, hey, so I was listening to this song and I know you can play the piano and I picked up the sheet music. And uh, I, so here's the sheet music. All right, bye. <laughs> so he what? was doing like little, little droplets of love. Yeah, and you love. were, would you say that you were resistant because of previous relationships or because of the timing of this one? Because it seems like maybe you had a pattern of kind of rejecting guys that I, I don't know. I, I think that's what I remember we talked about. Do you think that that was before him or do you think that that was something that was built up that he had to wear you down? <laughs> <laughs> there's actually a Korean saying that uh, huh? there's no tree trunk <laughs> so large that can't be, and I'm kind of butchering it, um, but no tree trunk so large that can't be chopped down with enough, like, you know, hacks at it. Uh, it's actually an old Korean saying. Yeah. Oh, God. So Aw, you- so you hacked her down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can say that. <laughs> yeah, Day, I was going to ask you, what did it? What was your reaction when she said no? What did that do? Did that make you even more determined? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, it's kind of Seinfeldy. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, what's what's the little guy, guy's name? Not Kramer. Not Kramer. Not the Seinfeld. Short, guy? The short guy, yeah. George, George Costanza. Yes. Yeah. I think there's an episode where basically he, instead of doing what he wanted to do, he would do the opposite of everything that he wanted to do. And his life and like things were getting better for him. So I kind of took that approach and, and said, <laughs> well, I would normally just like scurry away and feel rejected and go away. Uh, but maybe I will try persisting and go against what my natural instincts are. And uh, here we <gasps> are. Eight years later. <laughs> That's actually what exactly happened to me, too. Because yeah. normally I'd be like, hell no, slam the door, never talk to you again. But I was like, but he's, he's really pleasant, and I really like talking to him. But wait, why would you slam the door in his face? I mean, had he done anything bad that would make you instinctively not trust him? Or was this just in general you were, thought that these guys were trifling? Well, I think... Until that point, my experience with men, either through vicariously through my mother or myself, I'd always had like this three week to three month pattern. Uh, if I felt like I was getting too close or it was not right, I would just cut the relationship off just to save time and energy and all the heart heartbreak, unnecessary heartbreak, you know. And uh, I also had in my mind that I would never get married. And if I got married, it'd be much, much later in life. And so there's a lot of like unnecessary self mechanisms the defense mechanisms I built in my own brain of how life was going to work. And here comes along this guy who was everything that I told myself I would not, not marry. And here we are. <laughs> um, 
but he was just different. And so I was like, well, you know, typically I would never talk to him again, but I really like talking to him. And typically I would not be entertaining this guy and going to pick up. Remember you asked me to pick you up from the airport? I was like, I never pick anyone up from the airport. Never, ever, ever, ever. Especially guys. Yeah. Ever. <laughs> I do not do such things. And then here I, I found myself like driving to the airport at night, picking him up. <laughs> You know, at that time, I, I never went to weddings. Like, I hated weddings, would not show up to them. And he asked me, hey, will you come to my wedding, this wedding with a friend's wedding? And I was like, we're not dating. We're not going as a couple, but I'll go. <laughs> so I don't wow. know. There's a lot of... Baggage. Baggage. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe, I don't know. I think I knew that he was one, he was one of the good guys. Yeah. I, well, it also sounds like he gave you a lot of stability and like being stable and also being thoughtful, which is kind of rare these days with guys. Extremely thoughtful and also just super dependable. There was nothing that could blow in his face or knock him down. Even if he fell down, he would get up and be like, hey, I'm still here. <laughs> oh, so I love that. That's, that's what I knew and thought about him. Well, so had it. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say he also seemed so willing to do the work. Otherwise, I mean, if he was playing certain kind of couple therapy books or whatever while you guys are driving, that's obviously somebody that's interested. Was there anything that you guys like read together in the beginning or, or different kinds of like pieces of advice or work that you've put into the relationship that you found helpful? Before we decide to officially get married, uh, we did do a, like a pre-marriage course with this church. And when we started this pre-marriage course, um, I mean, we had barely just started dating. So it was kind of like, you know, the cart before the horse in a lot of ways. Well, we looked at each other and said, well, if they can break this up, it's not, not meant to be. Good luck. They, they actually had a really good mentality on that. Uh, so it was a very Christian, conservative um, Super church. Super conservative. <laughs> and they viewed it as their job to bring up all the uncomfortable topics uh, with a couple that could cause conflict and eventual, you know, breakdown and uh, of the relationship. So it was, it was their view that they, it was their job to break us up. And if they couldn't break us up, then we had a decent chance of making it. And, what uh, were some of the uncomfortable topics they brought up? I mean, that sounds great. I mean, we were fighting, like, battling it out every week. I mean, even to the day before our wedding day, we were battling it out. Remember I was sitting on that couch before the wedding day, and I was like, oh, man, I don't know. How are we going to get married with us? Like, all this stuff Maybe going Maybe I on. blocked out a lot of the uh, <laughs> bad memories or something. I don't know. But, I mean, but, like, marriages, the top three issues in marriages are money, sex, and kids. Yeah. And so Those you... Were you know, so they bring that up and, and talk about, well, do you guys want to have kids? And then if there's some sort of disagreement there, then they really double click down into that topic. Over and over. Until, <laughs> yeah, I mean, and so it, it, there's a bit of a formula, I think, uh, once you kind of understand human behavior and especially relationship behavior. And, Don, and John Gottman, I mean, he's just a, a master at, you know, kind of diagnosing uh, subconsciously and consciously, all the data points when when he sees couples interacting, mm -hmm. uh, and so they this this one particular church, yeah, um, they just really really go into all the sensitive topics, yeah, and they they hit all the soft points like so if you want to talk about sex, you know, have you done X Y or Z ever? Please describe in detail what happened to your partner, and you're like, oh God, <laughs> or have wait, you how can you talk about that in church in church you're not supposed to talk about sex that's very bad nobody's even supposed to have it so what are they i mean they can't ask you graphic questions about that can they that seems inappropriate well, they expected us to talk to each other about those things and so you know oh okay a piece of paper and we would sit there with the same piece of paper and the question would be like have you ever x y or z please describe the situation what what happened and what what did you do and you obviously answer the question and then your partner will be like, what does that mean? And you'd be like, uh. <laughs> yeah, it's exercises to do between yourselves, not like in front of the class. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, talking about money. So, you know, they said, well, how are you going to, you know, take care of the money? Who's going to manage the money? Are you going to have your own separate accounts? Are you going to have a joint account? Are you going to have savings funds? How is that going to happen? You know, what do you guys think about spending, you know? If you had these choices, would you buy it or not buy it? You know, how would you go about buying it or not buying it and talking about these things? Because these are things you know, like, would you buy a used car or a new car? And like, 
you know, what if you don't have the money? What would you do? And like, I think it, uh, you know, like all the examples that Ari's giving, I mean, it's about really getting into the details and forcing people to really think about it uh, as much as, uh, you know, as much as possible before people actually get into that situation where they're, where they really, really have to. Mm -hmm. This is fascinating. Yeah. So before we were married, we knew how we would handle money. We, you know, it was many, 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 many weeks. And actually after we got married, I was very resistant into uh, the idea of children. So I told him, I don't want any children when we got married. Bold because you obviously have children. And a lot of times people say that they don't want children when they get married. And then it becomes sort of the thing that people argue about, but Mm -hmm. you know, Somebody says, well, I didn't want to have kids. Well, look, you're an example of somebody who changed their mind. So it happens, you know? I don't know how much you can take those people seriously. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know what I was talking about, obviously, because having children is one of the best things I've ever done in my entire life. And I wish I had started earlier. But when Day and I were dating, I was like, no. And he was, yes, he was campaigning very hard. There's even this one night where like we had a fight and I was so... I don't know, just overtaken with emotion and my reptile brain. And so I took a bag of bananas and smashed them all over the house. And we had banana guts and chocolate guts all over the kitchen, like walls and ceiling. (laughs) And it was after that moment where I, I thought, well, you know, why am I so resistant to the idea of children? And how do I know? Like, I have never had children. I don't know what it's like. I don't know anything. Maybe I should try. I'll, I'll tell him I'll have one child. And if I really hate it, we'll never do it again. But I'll give you one child. And so uh, that's where we kind of made peace. And you had already tested it by flinging bananas all over the kitchen. So what could be worse than that with a kid? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, it, there was banana guts everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> we tried having children shortly thereafter. And uh, that's when I started uh, really hitting home. Like when you decide you want to have children, things, nature does not just give you children. And so it took us a really long time to figure out how to get pregnant. I mean, you would think, you know, he drops in some seeds and boom, you, you, you make a baby, right? While you're ovulating. It's not that easy. And then uh, we actually got pregnant a couple of times and um, miscarried. So the first miscarriage, like both Day and myself were so heartbroken. And that's where it dawned on me, like, wow, I did not realize that this was going to be such a hard, big deal. Like I, I thought I never wanted children. Here I am like so heartbroken over our miscarriage, you know, and then happened again, this miscarriage a second time. And we were both just, Oh my God, it was pretty, pretty rough time for us. And then, yeah, like having the first child and that whole experience. And he was a tough one, man. I mean, he's still a tough one, (laughs) the lentil. But he's four years old now. (laughs) What I learned through this process of day um, meeting day, getting married today, having a baby is that you can't control life. And the best parts of life are not what you thought it were going to be at all. To allow myself to just not fight so hard against life and take moments to enjoy life and just be happy with the gifts that are in front of me. I think that's beautiful. Thank you guys for sharing that. Yeah. So- I don't think a lot of people talk about miscarriage. I had a friend recently have one and she was saying, you know, why does everybody have to hide this? It happens so often. You know, why can't I talk about it? Because I guess with some people, they don't want to talk about it. You're not allowed to ask other people. They do want to talk about it. And, you know, maybe it makes other people uncomfortable. So I think that's a really valuable thing to bring up. I have some friends who are having children later and we're not so sure about it. And they all seem to be very happy with the decision. I think when you look at kids, they look very messy and loud and annoying and expensive. But I have heard that it it is, you know, the the like a whole new level of living. So I think that's really nice to talk about. Yeah, I don't know. That's it. I like I like what you guys had to say. Appreciate it. So you guys were really there for each other when you went through everything. Did you really, did you know once you had, I don't and if this is too private, just let me know. But did you know after the first and second that you definitely wanted to keep trying? Like what, what kept you going after going through all of that emotional pain? Oh, it was so painful. Like actually after the second miscarriage, both Day and I were just so emotionally depleted and uh, tired that we told each other that we were going to take a break. We said, let's just take a break and put the baby making in the back burner. We both want children, but maybe it's not in the card for us. And so let's just take a break and 
get back to our lives and focusing on our careers and friends and family and our home here. And, you know, we had a dog. So that's what we did. And then um, I think we did a trip to Vegas. <laughs> that, was, that was the lentil, right? Uh, that was, uh, yeah, your startup days. Yeah, yeah, that was a trip to Vegas. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I had a startup that I was running and we ended up uh, going to this conference in Vegas. And Day is, you know, the, one of the most supportive, endearing husbands, as you can, you can kind of hear. Um, so he's there, you know, being super supportive. And I don't know, I guess the magic of Vegas happened. <laughs> What? <laughs> After all of that, Las Vegas After is the place. That, yeah, we're like, drink it up. Yeah, we're in Vegas. You know, start up live, hustle. And then a couple, uh, couple of months later, I think it was like seven or weeks or so, eight weeks. I missed my period, and it was like three weeks, four weeks late. It's like, fine, I'll try and take a, you know, pregnancy test. So I had like this box. They come in boxes of three sometimes. So I bought this box, and there's three in there. And I took a test and I was like, no, I'm going to take another one. No. And the uh, day sitting outside in the bedroom was like, Harry. I'm like, I took another one. No, what? It can't be true. So like I came out and I'm like, day, we're pregnant. Wow. That must have been so crazy. Did you guys, were you guys afraid now that this was actually, you know, you were off to the races? Uh, how did you get prepared? We didn't. We decided not to tell a single soul. Uh, because we did not want to, you know, break the news of another miscarriage. Yeah, it's a really sensitive time period because, you know, when a couple gets pregnant, uh, you're not only going on a journey yourself, you know, if you're part of the couple, but then like if you tell family and friends and everything, then it kind of sets up this massive, massive expectation. And if it doesn't work out, then it becomes a huge emotional kind of letdown. And after two miscarriages, and that's why they, that's why they, a lot of times couples and maybe doctors, they kind of recommend not, you know, not telling folks until you get after the first trimester. Yeah. And so a lot, a lot of thoughts on this, but yeah, it's, it's just very, it's a very emotionally, psychologically, really, really sensitive time period for couples. Well, also side note, it's also physically really hard. Cause like you think miscarriage, Oh, the baby just didn't happen. But the first procedure I did, I, I was thinking, well, I think I was so distraught and so, I'm so, just so, I don't know, heartbroken that I wanted to put myself through as much pain as possible. Kind of just, I wanted to physically feel the emotional pain I was going through. So they, uh, they, they call it a DNC procedure. I don't know what the full like technical name is, but they go in and so like, I haven't had a baby and they take the cervix and they like pull it apart and probably the most painful thing I've ever experienced in my entire life, but I decided to do it without anesthesia. <laughs> and so the first uh, DNC, they, they scrape your inside out and you know, any remains of, you know, whatever may have formed inside of you while you're alive on the, ta on the table. And so there's a lot of physical, like you can't walk after that sort of procedure. Um, there's just a lot of bleeding. It's just really painful. And if you decide to do it like I did, don't ever do it like I did. I, I mean, anybody that's listening out there, if you have anybody that's deciding what to do, what to, how to do a DNC procedure, go to the hospital and do it with anesthesia. Totally recommend it that way. So I did it the first time without the anesthesia. And then the second time I did it with anesthesia, but even that time, like, you were like in bed, like after the procedure, you can't walk. I mean, they say you can walk, you can, but it's very, very uncomfortable. Oh, wow. Also That's things wild. people don't talk about, right? And so like, you know, if you're going through miscarriage and people don't talk about these things and then you're like, oh, I've had a miscarriage and they're telling me today that I need to decide what sort of procedure I'm going to do. You know, like, what does this mean? I'm what curious. Mean? Oh, go ahead, Steph. I'm curious about other people's responses and reactions because, mm -hmm. you know, I haven't experienced this personally, but I have experienced, you know, losing a close family member. And there was really like a react, like a range of reactions for people. And a lot of them weren't very helpful. They don't know what to say. It's more about their own discomfort at hearing this news than giving you comfort and consolation as the person who has lost someone really close to you. And so what was your experience with that? And was there anything that people said that was most helpful? Yeah, that's definitely mm -hmm. true. Uh, like our parents as first generation immigrants <laughs> and younger parents, I mean, they just could not even comprehend the idea of a miscarriage. And so, you know, to, you know, that generation of parents who had kids earlier, 
And among their friends, their peers who also were parents earlier and just didn't have, you know, that kind of experience, uh, it's just super hard, maybe impossible to relate uh, to the people who have the loss. Maybe even in those days, the, it, even if they did have a miscarriage, maybe they didn't even know. Uh-huh. Or, you know, it, it's such a kind of viewed as like a shameful, you know, um, um, uh, experience that they don't even talk about it. So then nobody even knows, you know, that it happened. And so, yeah, it becomes super hard to, you know, relate to the couple. Yeah. I mean, they're saying like, well, what happened? What did you do? Like, maybe you did something wrong or, and then it becomes all about like, oh, you know, you didn't eat enough. And I told you, you should have slept more. And, you know, I told you, blah, blah, blah. Like, oh, that sounds so terrible because it's not your fault. Like, as far as I know, statistically, yeah. third, like a third of pregnancies uh, spontaneously end in miscarriage in the usually early on, like yeah. in the first trimester. And it's, it's not that you're doing something wrong or that you did anything to want to cause this. You wanted a baby more than anything. Right. So, But it's really hard to translate that. <laughs> it's also hard to like remember the facts when you're in this very emotional state and you've also physically undergone like a very traumatic event to your body and then having these sort of questions that you know don't make sense not affect you is really 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 hard yeah i imagine so do you girls want to jump in yeah i was wondering about you were calling i think you were calling your oldest a lentil (laughs) (laughs) I wanted to maybe jump on a happier topic and hear about that. We're obsessed with food. Um, We have food beginnings. So we have little nicknames for our children for the online world and for our friend world, uh, just for like privacy and security. So, you know, our first child, we call him the lentil. And it's because when we found out he, you know, he was a real baby, um, he was the size of a lentil. According to the baby books, you know, they say like, oh, you're seven weeks or 10 weeks and your baby now is the size of a whatever it is, right? So he was the size of a lentil when we found out. So he became the lentil. And then the second one, we didn't want to call him the lentil again. Um, I don't remember when we found out. It was a little bit later, too. It was right around the size, right around the time when he was the size of a quinoa. So we named him quinoa. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. I love it. So yeah, it I really like, like that kind of like an online code name, uh, so to speak, you know, uh, it's a, it's a pseudonym. (laughs) I like that too, for privacy, because you never know how the child is going to feel about having their likeness and their name on the internet when they don't even have a choice about that. Right. So is that something you were thinking about? For sure. Yeah. So, you know, making sure that our children are safe, um, and we, we're doing all that we can to keep them safe. Of course, we want to share the, you know, the moments of our lives that are meaningful, especially with people in our communities and our families and friends. And so it allows us to participate, but also maintain some level of obfuscation or anonymity. Yeah. I I had a question, but I forgot what it was um, (laughs) before you guys started talking about the quinoa and the lentil. Um, Oh, I know what it is. Okay. So do you guys have sort of, Korean tradition in the household in terms of rearing your children? And do you think that that's a blend with kind of your California style now? I mean, you guys aren't in California, but West Coast has its own sort of, I guess, a little bit more liberal kind of parenting style. So how have you guys melded those two worlds together? Do you have certain traditions from home that you keep doing? Yeah, well, actually, well, so days made in Korea, I'm in the USA. And so it's basically a good symbol of how we are living our lives today. Like for the first 18 months of the lentils life, my parents-in-law, Day's parents lived with us, which is very atypical Korean families today to do that extended family thing. But we felt it was right for our family. And so Day's parents lived with us for quite some time. My mom also lived with us for about six months as well. And so we really got to benefit from their their. I guess, influence. And they also live very close by. And so they see the kids at least once weekly. So we're very, very, very lucky on that. And, you know, they're singing the traditional Korean kid songs to them. And we have a lot of the uh, Korean gifts from our family in Korea that they send to us. And so, you know, we sing 
Korean songs, we eat Korean food. Lunar New Year just passed, and so the kids, you know, they did the traditional Korean bow. Well, one kid, the other one can't really stand yet. <laughs> yeah. um, Korean bow to the grandparents and uh, received gifts of money. He was really excited about that. I mean, uh, from my perspective, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, now that you call it out, uh, thinking about it, it is kind of more the West Coast style-ish. And then, you know, we bring in a good amount of um, like a Korean culture with respect to the food. Mm -hmm. So like the lentil already eats like, um, you know, watered down, non-spicy kimchi. And kimchi is like a massive, massive like staple of uh, a Korean food. And then, you know, they, they get a lot of exposure as much as we can to the grandparents, uh, you know, as first generation immigrants. And Do they uh, speak Korean? Like, are they speaking to the children in Korean? Yeah, yeah. So like little like Korean nursery rhymes. And then, you know, my mom is really good about using uh, Korean knowing that they don't even understand, but just kind of giving them that exposure uh, is, uh, is kind of nice. Yeah. But, you know, it's a, it's a very much of a yeah, kind of a mixed environment that we're in. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything that you've consciously chosen not to include that you experienced as children? Well, I grew up, he says I was raised by wolves. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in a single parent family. My mom raised both myself and my brother, and uh, she worked a lot. So that part, you know, we don't have in the family because, you know, they have two, two parents. No, I, I can't really, um, you know, I can't really think of anything that we're purposely trying to exclude. I think these days with a nine-month-old and a four-year-old, we're just trying to survive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how do you deal with that, like... Okay, so you're both business owners, like you actually, you're, you're partners in business, right? As well as in life. And so can you talk a little bit about how you deal with that? And what do you sleep? When do you sleep? Yeah, people don't realize, uh, and I totally took this for granted. But yeah, sleep is uh, one third of your life. Everybody <laughs> hears that and nods, but they don't really understand how important it is. But having children basically will destroy your sleep for <laughs> maybe like a decade or so. At least, yeah. Uh, and then you, you know, the more kids you have, just, it's just more intense, like uh, it's more intense destruction of sleep. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, no one told me that I would go into a clinical depression because of all the sleep deprivation and sleep, um, you know, uh, interruption. But yeah, it, it is literally kind of like, you know, day to day, who's going to wake up, who's going to be screaming, who's going to come into the room, you know, all this, all this kind of survival who's level stuff. Have a night terror. Yeah, yeah. It's just, yeah, it's really, really hard. And we're tr both trying to, like you said, you know, uh, keep a, you know, business running and you know, basically be like freelancers and, you know, pay the bills, keep food on the table, roof over the head, all that kind of stuff. It's a lot of coordinating. I mean, we've taken technology into our home life. So like we use Slack for all our um, coordination between Day and myself on like the home front. I call it home operations. We talk about um, our coordinating with family members and their birthdays. We have channels for each of the kids so that, you know, depending on which kid needs what, you know, either Day will take it or I'll take it. Um, we tend to both want to take our kids to the doctor. So Day and I will both go to our doctor appointments for the children. Yeah. That's interesting. Is that a thing from John Gottman too? Because I know he says have a marriage meeting for a successful marriage. Yes, we actually have a quarterly offsite where we talk about our strategies for a marriage too. So we'll talk about all the buckets that are really important to us. You know, like there's finances, career, what do you want to accomplish with your life? And how are we taking care of our, you know, extended family members, especially our parents? Just, wow. just travel. Are we saving enough? Like we do the strategy offsite. I mean, I think that kind of uh, stems from our professional lives being, you know, information workers, office workers, and just being used to that. Again, you know, that's like at least a third of your life. And so, you know, we bring that into our personal life uh, to, to make it work the best we can. Um, well, that's also how windshield time came out. So like, you know, Day has, you know, this 20 some plus year life career in sales. And so when I started doing more active sales, when was that like 2010, 11? Um, I turned to Day for a lot of my sales advice. 
And uh, he taught me this thing called windshield time, which is what our podcast is called too. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. And windshield time is usually when like he would go out with his sales rep. And if you're in the car together driving to a sales meeting, like you have windshield time where you talk about planning for that meeting that's upcoming and they call it windshield time. And so they told me about that. He's like, you should do that with your sales reps. You know, when you're going out to meetings, I'm like, oh, that's brilliant. You can like get there, have your cake and eat it too. That's great. And so we brought it into our marriage. So it was like, hey, I got to run an errand to college. Costco, right? When we were always going to Costco, I, he was like, you want to come with me? We can have windshield time. Or when we drop the lentil off at, you know, preschool, you'd be like, Hey, you know, I'll, I'll do the drop off, but you want to come and we can have windshield time on the way back, you know? And so we brought it into our marriage um, so that we can talk about, you know, what's going on for the day or, Hey, I need to talk about something. Can we use it during this windshield time? And then we're like, Hey, actually, you know, the way we're living our lives, you know, everything is sort of like intermingled into one big pot right now with our children and our the extent of family and our careers and our life interests and travel and all this stuff is one big bucket. Let's, let's share this because I think this is really the future of work. People aren't going to have one job where they work eight to 12 hours a day at one job for the rest of their lives. Things are changing. People are working multiple jobs and they have multiple side hustles and incomes. And so people should live their whole lives. There's actually another kind of uh, idea behind the windshield time. It's that Obviously, the person driving is going to have part of their attention diverted towards driving and, you know, uh, making sure to stay safe. And so, but then the passenger also is riding in the car. And so they're facing forward. Each person is facing forward. And it's sort of like this weird um, keeping your brain very slightly distracted enough so that you can, you know, theoretically have, still have a good conversation um and have your mind be a little bit free yet still be a little bit distracted Mm -hmm. it's it's kind of like a weird inverse um you know thinking well the term is like suspension of attention yeah so the fact that like you know steve jobs he would go on walks to do a lot of his talks um oh that's a perfect example yeah yeah so um having some part of your brain sitting on some other topic that's sort of automatic automatic like driving or walking while doing conversation side by side actually allows for a lot of sync syncing between the t- people that are synchronization yeah and so it's actually really really good good technique that i would recommend for other people and actually when we go out to eat sometimes our preference is just sit side by side and sit together and eat together it allows for you to kind of also sit like figuratively and literally shoulder to shoulder as partners just enjoying a meal you guys are such a cool couple i love this <laughs> <laughs> this is great. So how many episodes have you guys done of, of the podcast? And like, what's on for season two? Because I think you're launching season two right now. Yeah, so 2020, we're counting as season two. Uh, we have in the can, you know, like 60 solid episodes. Um, you know, being in the business yourself, like, you know, you kind of got to snack up the podcast because the shows are can, can tend to be a little bit long. And so I started like making mini or micro podcasts uh, out of the longer shows. Uh, But yeah, we were doing, pushing out two shows a week uh, ever since June of 2019. And then this year we're kind of going more on like a one show a week schedule. Um, But yeah, we we cover, you know, all kinds of topics uh, in and around related to money and Bitcoin and trying to be, trying to be like a friendly on-ramp. Uh, non-technical on-ramp for people who are curious about Bitcoin and, you know, related topics. Careers, investing, startups, fundraising. You know, I wonder how many other couples are are implementing tech the way that you guys are and also being so open-minded. I think it's really refreshing. I was talking with somebody recently about relationships and and actually quite a few different people. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that a lot of couples necessarily want to do the work. So I think it's, you guys have a recipe for success over there. I think it's great. It's really nice. Yeah. Do you guys have any kind of advice for our listeners? I mean, <laughs> the, way, the way I got started here is that I just did, for the guys out there, I think, who have uh, trouble dating, I think, you know, maybe just try it out. Do the opposite of what you'd want to do <laughs> and see how it turns out. <laughs> it sounds kind of funny, but, you know, um, 
Maybe, maybe that's a way to go. I don't know. I think that's advice for all people too. Like, you know, what I thought I wanted, you know, the tall European French accent, blah, blah, blah. Like try and do the opposite and focus on the things that really do matter in life. Uh, slow down. I know sometimes we want to go faster, but slow down. Take other people on the journey with you. Stop and smell the roses more more in life especially if you have children they'll force you to but just stop and smell the roses you know like you know in this very moment i'm very thankful to have been able to work with tatiana spend some time with tatiana when she was in seattle and have her in our home and have her meet our children and get to hear her sing again and you have a really 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 like heartfelt good voice when it comes to singing and uh, share that with my husband and you know, like we're big fans of everything that you do. And um, it's great to meet you, Stephanie. And I know Lauren isn't on anymore, but you know, it's great to meet you guys. And I think sharing and the more that we can reach across, you know, computer screens and devices and country and state borders, the better life will be for everybody. Absolutely. I really recommend that everybody listen to your podcast. Where can people catch up with you online? Can you give us some links? Yeah. So our podcast is called Windshield Time. We're available on all the uh, audio listening platforms out there. You know, the Spotify's, Apple's, blah, 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 blah. (laughs) (laughs) I'm really psyched about the fact that we just got our custom YouTube URL. Yeah. Because when you start out and, you know, with your own channel, they give you this like gobbledygook of like letters and characters. Nonsensical. And, uh, you know, we finally got to the point where we (laughs) were able to have our own custom URL. So it's youtube.com slash C like channel slash windshield time. And so it makes it super, super easy to share. Uh, What's the criteria? Do you need to have a certain number of views or subscribers for that? 100 subscribers. 100 subscribers. You need to be uh, at least 30 days old. Um, You know, you got to, I think that behind the scenes, they want to see you upload stuff, you know, on a regular basis. There's like a little half page of criteria that you have to meet before they'll, they'll give it to you. Um, but you know, being very goal oriented people, we are, uh, it just gave us, you know, another, <laughs> another place to, you know, work towards. Yeah. So we just crossed the uh, 100 subscribers last, this past weekend. Yeah. Thank you everybody that helped us do that. Very active on Twitter. So I'm at Airy in Seattle. It's very boring. I wish I had a better name and I need to think of a better name. It's totally not cool, but it's at Airy in Seattle. And, Day- I'm, and I'm luggage junkie on Twitter as well at luggage donkey which came from the days of the lentil so he would not let me lift a single finger when i was pregnant and so he would carry everything including all the hands. yeah so he called himself the luggage donkey which is why he's called at luggage donkey on twitter i couldn't understand what that meant that's so sweet and darling i think a lot of the men that are listening to this show uh should take some pages from his book day you are a you are a light of of manliness (laughs) Very good. Southern, southern, southern gentleman with his salt and pepper. Oh, you're right. It's the South. Yeah. <laughs> that's what the South is going on. <laughs> they have manners. Um, I think that's lovely. This is such a good interview. This is definitely one of my favorite interviews. You guys have to come back on soon, I hope. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I, one, last, one last thing I'll throw out there is, uh, you know, if anybody wants that, you know, like, I think it's a 45 minute MP3 file of uh, the oh, John yeah. Gottman show. Mm-hmm. I mean, literally, you don't have to read a book. You just sit there and listen to John Gottman in his amazing, wise, humorous, super intelligent, knowledgeable voice, like tell you what it takes to make a relationship. Yeah. I mean, he even bre- breaks down, you know, a mathematical formula that you can follow to you know find good relationships and also create good relationships not just with uh, significant others but also i think it's crazy applicable with work relationships as well yeah you know it's like like you said uh you know like someone said like the four horsemen of uh you know marriage apocalypse i think it's extremely applicable also towards working relationships Mm -hmm. Because if you have defensiveness and contempt. Uh, contempt and, you know, stonewalling towards your working, you know, peers, that's not going to be a working relationship for very long. You know? It's the death of that relationship. Yeah. yeah, that was me who mentioned the four horsemen. And I've been a big fan of this. Um, it's true. Like all relationships are based on some degree of trust and you build trust by showing the other person that you're listening to them and you are, you have good intentions and, 
Um, these are just techniques that make communication better and easier. Yep. Yep. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's like no one's innately, I, I don't think anyone's innately born with these skills. These are skills that are learnable, practicable. Yes. And, uh, you know, it, it, it can just, I, I think it can make people's lives a lot better once they know that these uh, basic tools exist. Okay. So where do you get this 45 minute John Gottman speech? You know, I don't know where it is, but uh, <laughs> Um, oh, you have it? Okay. I have it. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, if, if anyone pings me, I can share it with you guys too. And um, I think you know. we should upload it to our YouTube channel or, <laughs> or, and then like share it out. Uh, that would be great. Yeah. Or, or we can, you know, before we air the show, we can try to put a link into the show notes for that. That's a good idea. Yeah, that's a good idea. Even if you guys put it out on your thing, it'll drive people to, to subscribe to the channel. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Day and Ari, I have to say, you know, uh, it's not, I'm always a little bit skeptical when we're interviewing a couple because I'm like, oh, are they going to be interesting or are they just going to be kind of like, <laughs> you know, lovey-dovey kind of everything's great. But you two, I have to say, I was really impressed by you. I'm really interesting. They're fantastic, right? Yeah, you're, yeah. You, you know how to podcast. Clearly, you're very self-aware. You've done the work on yourselves and on your marriage before you got into it. And gone into it with a lot of awareness and consciousness, which makes it uh, great for people to learn from you about things that they might want to emulate. So thank you so much. I'm really glad to have been introduced to you and I hope we can talk again. Yeah. yeah likewise. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hopefully we get to see each other in real life. Um, if you're ever in Seattle, look us up or if we're ever where you are, we'll uh, look you up. Thank you. That would be great. I'm on the East Coast in New Hampshire, so uh, the whole whole continent away, but maybe there'll be some opportunity. Awesome. awesome. Okay, guys. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening to Proof of Love. Go to proofoflovecast.com. Submit your questions. Find us on social media if you want to talk a little bit more about politics and activism uh, and cryptocurrency projects. Uh, listen to thetatianashow.com. That's it, folks. Uh, listen to us on Let's Talk Bitcoin Network, and we'll see you next time. Make sure you go out and subscribe to Windshield Time. Thank you so much to our guests for joining us today. We'll see you next time on Proof of Love. Show me your heart. I know that it's beating. Tell me that you love me too. So I know your heart is true. Cause I need Cause I need some proof of love Cause I need some proof